Give the Lord, give the Lord all the glory. Everybody give, give the Lord all the glory, please. In this house, amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much. I'm going to get in, in the message here in about two minutes or so. I love getting up and preaching. I don't want you to miss tonight. I'm going to preach on getting ready for what's about to happen. And it is a revelation from the Spirit of God. You've got to be here. Try to bring somebody with you if you can. And, and uh, you know, people... People sometimes would love to be here, but they live distances away and they watch on the internet, which we're thankful for. But uh, there's nothing like being here. It is so different being in the, how many know that's the truth? Being here is different, okay? And I'm looking for Charlie Ellis. Yeah, stand up, Charlie, or however you're doing this. I don't know. Just so you'll know, we went and got our three main prophecy books. That's on visions. The other one's called America Apocalyptic Reset. The third one's called the... Uh, in time, I wrote it and don't know. The final ciphers. He's going to do a, di a special discount if you want all three. And of course, you guys went crazy about those shop, the, the, not the prayer shop, but the cashmere's. And so he brought a bunch of those too. The table's out here, right? So go, go there before service, after service or whatever. I do not like to advertise in a service, but I, I, I'll let you know that because some of you do, do not know that. Now you better be ready because I, I got a preview in the spirit of what the Holy Spirit's going to do tonight. And it will be the wildest service of the whole meeting. If you don't like the Lord showing up, you stay home. But if you like Lord God showing up, you better be here. God's going to show up. I'm telling you, where's my balcony people? Come on, I want to hear some balcony. There you go. There you go. Let's get, let's get right into this message. I never, ever, my wife knows that I can count on one hand in 47 years that I have preached the same message twice in a service. I do not do it. It's almost like a law of mine. But this was so powerful, and the Lord wants me to tell you a different story at the end of this that I know I have to do this. I'm going to preach on, <laughs> not that. I'm going to preach on loving God but not liking church. <laughs> Second Chronicles chapter 27, 1 through 2, guys, the verse we used earlier. Jotham was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Yeshua the daughter of Zadok. Those, that, that Zadok is very, a very important name here, very important person. And he did that, which was right, in the sight of the Lord, according to all his father Uzziah had done. Now, here's the, this is the part I'm going to have to explain in a minute. Although he did not enter into the temple of the Lord, and as a result of him not going to church, the people acted corruptly. And, and there, there is the scripture on the screen. I'm going to give you something I gave the folks this morning, and that is you can do a right thing in a right way. You can do a right thing in a wrong way. You can do a wrong thing in a right way, and you can do a wrong thing in a wrong way. And I have stories in the Bible on all of those, and I'm not going to preach those four stories. But this is a guy, a man, a king, Uzziah, who's one of the most noted kings in, in, in biblical and Jewish history. And he did everything right for 52 years and got to the very end of his life and he made a huge mistake that affected his son spiritually. Let me say it again. He made a mistake that affected his son spiritually. And I'll, I'll tell you about that in a moment. Now, how many of you are second, third, or fourth generation Christian, meaning you got a background in church and Christianity? Raise your hand and wave it at me right here. All right. How many of you know that's a blessing? Here is, here is a man named Jotham. So let me tell you about his family. First of all, his dad is, let me, let me talk about his mother. His mother is Yeshua. And it says about her that she was the daughter of Zadok. Zadok is a name you'll see throughout the time of David and Solomon. He was the high priest that when they tried to just destroy David, he was the faithful high priest because he was faithful to David when Jesus returns and builds the temple in Jerusalem. That's Ezekiel 44 through 47. Then the Bible says the sons of Zadok, which are the descendants of Zadok, which will be the men raised from the dead. How many of you know there's going to be a resurrection of the dead one day? They're going to be raised from the dead. So his descendants will be the priest at the temple that Jesus will one day build in the city of Jerusalem. So this is a very famous man. So this is, this is his daughter. This boy's mother is the daughter of this great priest. Now, the king, 
who was his dad, was uh, Uzziah. He became king when he was 16 years of age. He ruled for a total of 52 years. And this guy would be the Jensen Franklin of the day because this man is a visionary. How many know Pastor Franklin is a visionary? Building all over the world for the kingdom of God. Well, King Uzziah did everything that was right in the eyes of God, and he was a visionary. And I'm telling you, he would build the he would rebuild the gate here. He would rebuild a, a something connected to the temple here. He would go over here and he would build a great army. I mean, everywhere you look, I could read a list. It's this long in my Bible, in my King James translation, of building after building after building after building after building. I mean, he was known as a notable king. Now, here's one of the things that really impressed me. I was studying this verse one day and I was, whoa, do you realize the friends that he had? Some people got friends in low places. Some people got friends in high places. Uzziah, now imagine this. You are the dad. You are the son of this great king. Guess who you get to eat dinner with and lunch with? The prophet Isaiah, who wrote 66 books in our translation of the Bible. The prophet Zechariah. You know, it was Zechariah that even says in the Bible, in the last days, Jerusalem will be a cup of trembling, and I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. That's the man that is, I, I mean, if he's in heaven, and, oh, if he's in heaven, of course he's in heaven, but being in heaven, if he could look down or God would tell him what's going on, he's seeing some of his own words fulfilled if the Lord allows him in heaven to know that, okay? So here's what I'm going to say. Can you imagine Isaiah is the one who talked about this boy's dad's funeral. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. And then as he looked into the temple, he saw the seraphim, which are special angels. And they have three wings on each side. They cover their eyes with two wings. They cover their feet with two wings. And with two wings, they fly. And all they do is cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. So the fact that Isaiah mentions Uzziah tells me that he knew the king personally he was sad when he died, and he was sad, sad how he died. I'll get to that in a minute. And then there's Zechariah. Zechariah is the one that said, the Lord's feet will stand that day upon the Mount of Olives. This is Zechariah 14, by the way, which is eastward in Jerusalem, and the mountain will cleave in two parts, one part to the east, one part to the west. Zechariah tells you that when Jesus comes, that's who he's talking about. He will come to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem when he returns with the armies of heaven. Now that section of armies of heaven and him returning with the armies is the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. He comes uh, riding on a white stallion, steps on the Mount of Olives and the mountain cleaves. Now just going back to the point. So this young man got to sit at the table with some of the greatest prophets of the Bible. Not just these two. There were others that were giving prophetic words during that time. So what a heritage. Your dad is a godly king. Your mother's father uh, was Zadok, one of the greatest high priests of Israel. And now you have this great lineage of getting ready to sit down. Let me, let me tell you what it would be like. It would be like your children being allowed to sit with uh, Joyce Meyer for lunch and dinner for years. Uh, how many like Joyce? Come on, where's my Joyce fans in the house? Great woman of God. Or, or, or list any uh, man or woman of God that you live. And you, your kids get to hear. So here's what I'm trying to say. This guy had seed in him. He had the right seed in him. He, he, he had been doing the right thing, raised at the right time. And his dad attended the feast, attended the Sabbath, the new moons, all the things that were supposed to happen. But let me tell you what's really weird. How is it possible, and you know it is, and I know it is, that you serve God all your life, and then you hit a bump when you get older. How many of you know there have been people that have served God all their life and did everything that was right and something weird happened toward the latter years or the latter part of their life and they start making decisions that were not rational decisions. They start doing irrational things. Some people even fell into certain types of sin. That doesn't make sense. But here's the king, track with me now, that did everything right, but it gets to, he gets to be 52 years as a king and something bad happened. He made one absolutely crazy, wrong, deadly decision. And I'm going to give you the verse that tells you what he did. Here we go. It's in 2 Chronicles 26, verse 18. And this is Uzziah now. Remember, his son is going to replace him. But this is King Uzziah, whom we've just boasted about. But when he was strong, that means when he was at the peak of his kingship, peak of his ministry, we would say, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. So what was his sin? It was pride. But look what he did. He transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord. Now, let me stop. 
The temple was the temple that Solomon built. It was the most beautiful temple in the world. Jensen had the greatest message he preached one time, uh, greater than Solomon is here, and he describes the wealth, the billions of dollars of wealth that was in Solomon's temple. So he goes into the temple, and he burns incense on the altar of incense. Now, I'm not going to go through all the tabernacle temple furniture, but I'll just tell you what it was real quick. You had a brass altar where they offered animals and you'd go a few feet and there would be this huge bronze laver of water where the priests would wash themselves. Then you came to that sacred building and there was a doors there. And when you go into the doors, you would have three pieces of furniture, right? You would have on this side, what was called the seven branch menorah. Then you'd have right in front of you, a golden altar where incense was offered, uh, representing the prayers of all the people people that prayed every day. They would burn incense every morning and evening. And then over here on the right side, you have what's called a table of shoe bread with 12 pieces of bread. Then there was this huge veil. And then inside of that, we had the Ark of the Covenant. Now, where the Ark was, the high priest only went in that room one time a year. But the priest every day went into the second chamber and they burnt incense on the golden altar. And when the light of that menorah would go out, they would pour olive oil in those seven bowls that were shaped like eggs and they would relight the menorah. And once a week they would eat the bread, then they would replace that bread with new bread. So this was a major place. This was a big deal. This whole area of the tabernacle. Now here's where it gets interesting. I want everybody to catch this because this really gets interesting. So King King Uzziah, who is a king, is not a priest. Does anybody know that there were rules established by God about what a prophet can and cannot do, what a king can and cannot do, and what a priest can, can and cannot do? A priest was only allowed to go past that first door. In other words, where those three pieces of furniture was, you better be a priest. You better have a Levitical background if you're going to go in there. So what he does, which is interesting, he says, you know what? I've been serving God. I can hear him preaching. Can, can I do the old Pentecostal way? I tell you what, I've been serving God for 52 years, and God knows who I am. Oh, bless his whoop, holy name. You got to put a whoop in there somewhere, you know. Whoop. Bless his holy name. And I, I imagine that. that's the attitude he had. So he didn't think it was a big deal. God loved him. He served God. He did everything right. So probably this is a good thing to do. He takes incense and walks in with it to where only a priest can go. Then he starts getting ready to pour it out. And then the priest, Azariah, hears what he has done. And he gets real angry. And he calls 80 other Levites, all dressed in white. Hey, get over here. The crazy king has just broken through the door of the holy place. The king, what's he doing in there? He's not supposed to be in there. The judgment of God will come on him. He has crossed a line that it, he is never supposed to cross. And they went in. They're allowed in. They all gather around. They say, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm offering my prayers to God. What's it look like? They said, king, you know the law of Moses. You're not supposed to be in here. Only Levites that are chosen by God can carry the ark. Only Levites can touch this furniture. What are you doing? Then here's what it says in your Bible. He became angry. Now, when he became angry with the holy incense that was to be burnt on the altar. Now, remember, that altar represented the prayers of the people going up to God every day. In fact, an old rabbi in Jerusalem told me, I said, tell me about the gold altar. He said, it sat in the holy place. I knew that. But he said, all the prayers of Jews and non-Jews alike who believed in the real true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their words went there and gathered there. And when the smoke went up, the smoke went up in the words. And he said, do you know why God used the smoke? And I said, not really. He said, because it encased the words in the smoke and no demon could penetrate it. I, now, now that I didn't find that in the Bible, but I like that. Hallelujah. You know, so no enemy could get, so the smoke went straight up. Now you got to, you got to track me right here because this is where it gets a little bit deeper. Ready? At that moment, when he became angry, God let leprosy come on him. So all of a sudden, he's looking down his hand, and leprosy starts out with white spots and white patches. Then it comes up his neck and his face. Then at that moment, all the priests, by the law, have to back up. They can't touch him. They can't get near him because he is ceremonially unclean. Now, here's what happens at that moment. The king 
realizes he's done wrong. There's no record, however, for him to say he was sorry. He was so angry and caught up in his anger at the people in the ministry reacting to him the way they did that he became angry. So what happens is they back up and they, they lead him out and someone, it was a special man, had to lead him out and took him out, examined him enough to say he is a confirmed leper, took him to a special house. Now, here's what you have to understand. It wasn't like medicine today where you can put a mask and a robe on and go into a hospital and see your loved one. It wasn't like that. Once you got leprosy, if Jesus met a leper and the wind was blowing from Jesus toward the leper, he had to stay 100 paces away. That's the, that was the rule by the Jews. If the wind was blowing from the leper toward, a, toward another person that was clean, 300 paces away is how far you had to stay. And again, that was the rule back in the Old Testament time and even in the time of Jesus. Check this out. So here the guy, he's got leprosy, which means he's now under a complete judgment of God. Being under that complete judgment of God, this, 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 what does he do? He has to go live by himself. Now, here's the bad part. He cannot hug his wife. He cannot hug his kids. He cannot give her another kiss on the cheek or on the mouth. He can do nothing. There is at that moment no physical contact with anybody, listen, except other lepers. Because many times lepers live together. So, so Jotham, he is 16 years old. How many of you know a 16-year-old is very easily impressed one way or the other? Come on, where's my, where's my young people? Where are they sitting today, right? You know, when you're 16, things impress you. Hollywood people impress you. Singers impress you. So you're pretty impressed. Now, Jotham, he's really impressed, yes, but he's impressed negatively. It's like, wait a minute. Now, track with me. How can God give my dad leprosy when for 52 years, he did everything right? Are you kidding me? So, you, so is this what God does? Is this how God works? You serve him 52 years and you make one stupid mistake and then he's gonna kick you out? He's gonna tell you you can't be a king? Are you kidding me? And there's no doubt in my mind that in this young man's mind, there was real confusion. So now they have to put him in as king. So Jotham comes as king. Now, here's the thing that's crazy about him. Now, everybody track with me because this is where we're going to bring it down to where you live. Jotham was absolutely so into loving God, despite what he went through and he saw he had a love for God. Despite his dad having a bad experience in church And him being judged for his bad experience in church, I'm breaking it down practical. He, it said he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, here's what the Bible says. He built the gate of Ophel, the main gate of Jerusalem, by the way. He built cities in the mountains of Judea. Judea is the tribal area where Jerusalem is. He defeated the armies that rose up against him. He caused these armies to pay taxes. He caused other nations to pay taxes. And here's the verse. This is in the Bible. He became mighty because he prepared the way before the Lord. But watch what I'm going to say. So here he is. He's doing everything right in a right way. But he makes one mistake. But he never entered the temple of the Lord. That simply means he loved God, but wouldn't go to church. He loved God, but there was something about that temple that he had a negative feeling about it. Every time he looked at the temple, he thought of his dad getting leprosy. He couldn't, can I break this down? He couldn't drive past the church where somebody did him wrong. He couldn't drive past the church without bad feelings coming of some negative story that happened with a preacher, with a staff member, with people in the church, people that are, you see, this is sad, but it's true, but it's not really sad. It's just how it is. People expect Christians to live higher than they do if they're not Christians. Hey, you can't cuss, but they can. Right? You, you, can't, you can't lose your temper, but they can. And some of you work with people that's just waiting for you to slip. Where's my crowd now? They're just hoping 
They're hoping that you'll walk in and say, I just tell you what, I, I did something bad. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. I God, I knew she was a hypocrite. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. And they're waiting for you to fail and they're waiting for you to fall so they can have an excuse why they're not serving your God. So their excuse for not serving God is nothing God did for or against them. Their excuse for serving God is you. Because they think you're just a hypocrite. Oh, thank you all three. Can I preach to this crowd right here? Y'all are really getting with me. They think you're a hypocrite. They think that all people are hypocrites. They think the church is just after your money. I don't go to church. All they're after is money. No, I'm going to tell you who's after your money. Starbucks, McDonald's, Kroger, and the car dealer. If you don't believe they're after your money, try to go to the Starbucks line and not pay. Or try to go to Kroger and get a whole carton full of, and just say this. I don't know what y'all are after. You're making a lot of, you know how much these eggs are compared to what they used to be? You know how much a steak was before a year ago? Can I tell you, all you're after is my money and you ain't going to get it. Go out with that buggy and find out where you'll spend the night. You will have a prison ministry for sure. Right? And, and then I hear them say, all the church is after is your money. I'm telling you something. It just, it just drives me nuts sometimes to hear people say that. And then I'm going I'm to go ahead and say this. And then I hear people complain if a minister gets blessed. This man, look, can I tell you something about Pastor Franklin and his wife and family? I remember when they ran 250. I preached for him in a little building down there that started packing out. This man and his family have paid a price that nobody knows to see God do the things in all over the world. And they have, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just being truthful. And so God will bless men of God. And somebody will say, I just don't know why these preachers preach. Okay, I have some sports athletes that I'm not going to name. Quarterback of uh, Miami Dolphins is a personal friend. Okay, I'm going to quit name dropping here. But I got some friends that make millions of dollars in sports, right? And you know what everybody in sports says? Boy, he's a, he's a good one. They're paying him good because he's a goat. He's a top dog. Goat means the greatest of all time. You church folks don't know what a goat is. You think a goat's something else, but goat's good in this generation. The, the goat, the greatest of all time. Okay, let's stop. So it always bothered me how if a minister was blessed, people would complain. But if a secular person is blessed, it's like, oh, this is great. They call it success. If you're a preacher, they call you a crook. If you are secular, it's success. I'm going to talk to you. You ready for me to talk to you? Then a, press, a, min, a, a minister in Hawaii was getting his heart checked, had some heart problems, and his doctor said this. Hey, pastor, we're talking about, he, his church gave him a little pay raise, and some of the elders were upset and complaining. He said, preacher, this is a, this is a medical doctor. I don't remember the numbers. I'm going to have to fabricate the numbers because I don't remember exactly the numbers. But he said this. How much is it worth if you have a heart problem and a heart surgeon can fix the valves of your heart and give you 20 more years? He said, uh, well, I don't know. You tell me. He said, uh, back, this is a long time ago, 350,000 bucks a year. He said, easy. And I'm, again, I'm using, uh, there's other numbers, but you please understand how I'm saying this. Hey, what about a brain tumor, preacher? If you got a brain tumor and the brain surgeon can shave the hair on your head, open up your skull, get the tumor out that's cancerous and give you 30 more years, what's it worth? He said, I don't know. And he listed this hundreds of thousands of dollars that a brain surgeon would get. And he went to all the medical things that a doctor gets to keep someone alive. And then he said this, hey, preacher, how much is a man worth that can keep somebody out of hell? He made the point, you cannot put a money price or a gift price on men and women who preach the gospel that keep your sons and daughters and your family out of hell and help bring them the message of eternal life. Amen? Anyway, let's, let's look at Jotham again. So here he is. He doesn't go to the house of God. And I want to show you the results of not going. I realize, you know, Jensen will tell you, pastor will tell you, we have 50, 60,000. Now listen, this is not counting 20 people in a room, 25 people. And it's hundreds of thousands of people have been watching this revival. And we are grateful for the internet. 
We are grateful that those that live in the mountains and the Carolinas, they can't drive in like you can. And they are thankful. They literally have, they're having house parties, packing a house out, and people are falling out in the Holy Ghost, getting the baptism during this meeting. That's, that's been going on, all right? But I want to tell you what happened during COVID. Mm-hmm. During COVID, they made us have 10 people in a service. Did they do that in Georgia too? You couldn't have more than 10. Or Tennessee was, you couldn't have more than 10. And finally it got, oh, it got better. But you know what? The statistic was this, 50% of the people did not come back to church. A year later in some churches, I have been told 50% of their members never came back to church. Can I tell you what's spooky about that? Because in the parable of the 10 virgins, Five were wise, five were foolish, and when the door was open for the wedding, five wise went in, the five foolish were left out, and that's 50%. Woo, that's deep. That's 50% ready, that's 50% not ready. Did everybody get that? So it spooks me. So then we had somebody, and I'm going to go ahead and say this. They're probably watching this, so I'm going to say it. I'm talking to you. That's right. I'm talking to you. But we have a Tuesday night service and, uh, at Omega City International. And we had people, we kept, I kept saying, Pam, I know that couple didn't, they didn't die of COVID. I know they're okay. And how come they're not coming? And two and a half years after COVID, we see people who say, well, you know, we haven't quite made it back to church yet. But you could come. Oh, we could come. We're kind of afraid of crowds. Shut up and quit lying to the Holy Ghost. You went to the Georgia-Alabama ball game and all those people hucking and bucking and shimmy shy and you, you wasn't afraid of COVID then. You went down to Walmart during the Thanksgiving Blue Light Special when everybody was in it. You wasn't afraid of COVID then. You went down to Starbucks and got you a coffee with a bunch of young people and you weren't afraid of COVID then. I'm going to tell you what you are. You little sorry, lukewarm Christian. You are lukewarm and Jesus is going to spew you out of his mouth. You, if you're not afraid to get in public, and go to a restaurant, then you should never be afraid to come into the house of God where there's healing, where there's deliverance, where there's salvation. This is, I feel my help coming on. Hallelujah. This is where you need to be, man. If anything, you're in a place where they can pray for you. I might have lost 5% of you, but the 5% will show up and replace you. Okay, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, Lord, oh, Lord. But let me go back to this man. Here's what I want to say. The reason the God doesn't go to the temple, and I'm talking of Jotham, the son of this man, is because there was a bad experience that he had with his dad in the house of God. So he's going to, this is what he did. Well, you know what? I believe I believe Jesus, let's break it down. I believe Jesus is the son of God. I believe, I love the Lord. I love the Lord, but I just don't go to church. I had a, I had a worker one time that worked for me and they were, it was a good couple. I'm, I'm honest, they were a good couple, but he never went to church. He didn't go to church for 12 years. And so one day I said, so and so, why don't you go to church? He said, because I can't find an apostolic ecclesia in the town. Wait a minute. We got 380 churches in our county. Come on. And if you can't find something out of 380, it ain't apostolic ecclesia. It's something wrong with your head. You're the problem, not the church or the preacher. Okay. But I want to tell you something. We cannot forsake. Listen to what the Bible says. I've got to give you this real quick, and I've got, a, I've got a story the Lord told me to tell you. Listen to this. It says that when he didn't go to the house of God, the next verse ends by saying, and the people did corruptly. And the Lord spoke to him, and he said, people don't understand that when they take the Lord's day and they do everything else for months with their family and with their kids, we just want family time, we just want family time. You're teaching your grandbabies and your kids church is not significant. First of all, you're saying the Sabbath day means nothing. Number two, you're saying the church is not significant. Number three, you're saying it's not important. So what you're basically saying to them, the only time you need to go to church is when they marry you and bury you. 
Go to church when you're having a wedding. Go to church when somebody dies. But it's not important otherwise. And let me give you the verses. Ready? I'm going to tell you something. I want to build, I want to build the local body of Christ up today. I want to build the church up and help you to understand the significance. Number one, Hebrews 10.25. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day. That word, the day, is the day of the Lord, the return of the Lord approaching. Now, everybody's, everybody's pumped up right now, and you should be, about what's happening in Israel because the head of Turkey threatened to go to war with Israel. That is Tagarma in the book of uh, Ezekiel 38. That is Turkey is to Garma, and they are in the Gog of Magog war. Persia's threatening war. That's Iran. They have met together. Russia has met with Hamas. Folks, you don't understand. This is not a God just to Gaza war. This is the war to begin all wars. Everything in the Bible is now getting ready to start happening. That's why people are stirred. God stirred you up. You didn't get stirred up just to hear a sermon. Some of you have been telling me, I don't know what happened, but before this war started, God was stirring me up. Something's happening. You better get your family in. You better get them in the ark. You better get them together. So the reason that we don't forsake the assembly is because why? We have to exhort one another. We have to encourage one another. This is where you're not going to get your encouragement from secular unbelievers. They're going to try to pull you into what they're doing. You're going to get your encouragement when you walk in and the and pastor gets up and plays that saxophone. Look, uh, David can play the devil out of King Saul. Jensen Franklin can play a whole house full of demons with a saxophone out of people. You understand what I'm saying? That's the truth, man. That we, and when, when, when we're watching online, sometimes we, we get to watch online. I say, here, Pam says, oh, I just love when he plays that saxophone. She just sits there and she me oh, ho, sha, he, ya, ya, ha, hallelujah, you know. But watch this. Number two, do you understand from Matthew 16, 18, the church, which is the, it's in Greek, ecclesia, the body of Christ, we have supernatural protection. How do I know that? Here's what Jesus said. Upon this rock that I'm the son of God, I'm going to build my church. Now listen to the verse. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That word gates of hell can translate the strategies of hell. What Satan attempts to do will not prevail. Will the church be attacked? Yes. Christians in the world are being persecuted. Yes. But it says they don't win in the end. So don't you want to be part of something that Jesus says, I will protect it from the gates of hell. Now, the third thing you need to understand, I had uh, some former staff workers and I heard her say this one time and I thought, boy, this is a great saying. Someone was complaining about the church, you know, just complaining about well, that church, blah, 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 and those people, blah, blah. And the Lord spoke to her and said, let me tell you something. Uh, the church at times might act like it's a harlot, but it's still Jesus' bride. You don't talk about somebody's fiance. You don't criticize somebody who they're marrying. You don't criticize somebody's bride, right? She may be as ugly as homemade sin and look like a truck hitter, but you don't say, that's an ugly woman. I don't know why you're marrying her. You just say, oh, congratulations. Y'all going to have some interesting children one day. I just can't wait to see. I know I'm in a serious message. Y'all bear with me. Sometimes this humor comes out, but Ronnie Brock was pastor at North Cleveland one time, and there was a couple, and, let's, and honestly, they were, they were not a handsome couple. They were, can I not say more? Can I not say more? You under, do you understand where I'm coming from? And it was like, oh, God bless those poor kids when they were born. <laughs> and this, this couple had the most beautiful baby that looked like it was a doll baby in a store, and Ronnie got so excited. <laughs> The pastor of the church, he said, look, I'm like, Brent, look, bring the camera up. Look at this baby. Look at its face. It looks just like his pastor. <laughs> he never lived that. He never lived that blooper down. <laughs> number, number three, and I want you to hear this. I'm going to tell my story here. We're almost done. Number three is this, that when you read Matthew chapter 16 and you read other verses, the body of Christ has given authority to bind and loose, authority over the powers of the enemy, and authority to preach the word. We, this is where the anointing collectively comes together. Yokes are broken here. People are healed here. So there's a level of authority when the body of Christ unites that doesn't come just one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, we have authority one-on-one, -on -one, but one shall chase a thousand, two shall chase 10,000. If two or three of you shall agree as touching anything, it shall be done to them of the Father which is in heaven, right? Now, 
er, earlier, the, earlier in the service, the first service, <clears throat> the Lord took a whole shift. And I'm not going to go into all this. I'm only going to go into something that, that he put in my heart in the back room. Um, there are things that happen to you personally. And I'm talking to everybody in this room that at some point in your life, you will ask God, why did you let that happen? I have known of kids killed in car wrecks, young people. And I'm like, why in the world did that happen? Why couldn't that have been avoided? And so many times we get mail from people that have a tragedy that's happened in their life. And their biggest question is this, if God is so powerful, why didn't he stop it? Okay, and I realize some people can be at the wrong place at the wrong time. It's just like those people in the bowling alley. They happened to be at the bowling alley that night in Massachusetts, but they happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, not knowing what was going to happen. So sometimes it's wrong place at the wrong time. Sometimes it's being with the wrong people at the wrong place at the wrong time. Sometimes it's just an attack of the enemy. Like in the book of Job, a storm came and killed 10 of his kids. That was Satan that did that. That wasn't God. But in, the, in this morning service, the Lord really dealt with me about people have to do three kinds of forgiveness. Number one, you have to forgive others that have offended you. That's Bible. If you want to get blessed, you have no choice. You have no choice. You have to forgive others. Then you have to forgive yourself. Oh, hello. Where's all my people that had a big, bad life? And when you got saved, you hope nobody hears all your testimony because you did some bad stuff. Okay. And, and you just don't want everybody to know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes you got to just say, why, was I, why didn't I have more discernment? Why was I that stupid? Why did I let the flesh take over? And you live with that, and there just comes a time. It'll drive you nuts until you forgive yourself. And you just say, you know what? People fail, people fall. Maybe you were one. Maybe I was one. You have to forgive and move on. You'll drive yourself nuts if you don't. But here's another one. Sometimes you need to forgive God. You know, now, what do I mean by that? Does God need forgiveness? No. Does God do things in error? No. Why do you say forgive God? Because you're blaming him for something that he didn't do. You have an offense toward him because you lost something or someone, and you don't understand why. When old Robert's daughter and son-in-law we in a plane in Colorado going skiing. They actually flew into a mountain. I don't remember. I don't know if it was fog or what. Killed both of them, left three kids. Richard Roberts had to raise the three kids. And Oral was so grieved. They were grieving, grieving, grieving that he went on TV and talked about it. Evelyn said, what are you doing? He says, the only way I can get healed is talking about my daughter and son-in-law. Then I had a friend named Walter Hallam who there were a group of people from his church, including his 17-year-old preaching daughter, we're flying in a, I think it was a, three, a 421 airplane. Plane was packed and something happened to the engines and the plane crashed and it killed four people, including his daughter. Two survived. If she'd have been sitting in the opposite seat, she'd have lived. And Walter went down to the morgue to identify her and said all she had was a little bump on her head. Uh, the guy that survived said, the pilot said, we're going down, pray. And she started praying in tongues. And before the plane hit the ground, she went, <sighs> and God took her spirit out of her body before the plane hit the ground. But you know what? That 17-year-old girl. And he grieved. And he got such sorrow. And the Lord spoke to him and said, it's okay to sorrow. Do that. That's normal. But be careful grieving. Because if you grieve hard enough and all you do is ask questions, you'll never, a spirit of grief will come on you and you'll never pull yourself out of it. I have a friend of mine who's a pastor whose wife has died and it's several years ago, but I still hear him on the phone and I can still, still feel, the, feel the grief. You know, you're married for 40, 45 years, 50 years, and that happens. But, but grief is a spirit. Does everybody understand? It can be a spirit. Just like fear is not always a spirit, but fear can be a spirit. But, but track with me. I'm, I want to tell you this. Oral Roberts called him and said this. God visited Oral Roberts. I don't have time to tell you the story. But he said to Walter, Walter, one of the things the Lord told me to tell you is never don't ask why. Because if you start asking why, you're going to ask why the rest of your life. And God told Oral, there's things you don't understand about your daughter and son-in-law's death. I will tell you when you get to heaven. By and by, when the mornings come, when all the saints of God are gathered home, we will understand it better. By and by. Whew. Try to tell this. 
Uh, pray for the preacher. Give me about three minutes. Years ago, I had a dream of two little girls. And they came to me and I said, what's your name? Amanda, I'm the little girl you're going to have. I said, who's this? That's Rochelle. She's my sister. I saw two girls. I saw them twice. Amanda looked healthy. Rochelle did not. Rochelle had uh, almost like a Dow syndrome look, if you've seen these wonderful, beautiful children. And she was holding a stuffed animal. And, and it's like she was there, but she wasn't there. It's like emotionally or mentally, she wasn't. She was, she was distant. So I told my wife about the dream. My wife got pregnant and we had pink everything. I said, I think it might be twins, Amanda and Rochelle. Pink, 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 pink. And she comes home. I got to tell the funny story. She comes home with that. What is that called, honey? Not an MRI. Is it? <laughs> Ultrasound. I don't even know how to have babies and I had two. I mean, this is a miracle of God. You understand? So she comes with the ultrasound and she said, you thought it was a girl, but look at that right there. You know what I was looking at probably. It was a boy. That's all I'm going to say. So I knew then we're having a boy. I said, okay, what about the girls? 12 years goes by. And to make a long story short, the Lord spoke to me because I had a hand come on my leg one night when I came back from a mission trip and a baby was balancing itself in my old house we used to have by its hand. And I sat up and Pam said, are you okay? I said, you're not going to believe this. There's a baby's hand. I can feel the, feel it on my knee. I had, I had shorts on that, not that day and I could feel the heat of a baby's hand still on my hand. And I said, we're supposed to have that baby because you know, the Lord spoke to me. And I said, God, I saw two girls. We're not having them. And the Lord says, faith, but that works is dead. Perry, come on. God was saying, get with it, Stone. Come on. You can have a baby. So anyway, we, we made the arrangements, and she got pregnant. But here's the part that really was very sad. And I'm going to tell you this story. This is, this is a heavy story. She had a miscarriage during one of our conferences. I think about seven weeks into it or so. She's sitting there. She said, oh, my God, something's just happened inside of me. And I got her back to the room. She miscarried the baby right there. And like, look, she didn't hardly get to go to the camp meeting. And I said, Lord, why do you let my wife have a miscarriage? I know it was a girl. You told you showed me how to have girls. Now she's 39 years of age. How's she going to have a baby now? And then the Lord spoke to me through that incident of the hand. And I said, we're going to have another baby. She's a parent, parent of 40. I don't know if I can carry a baby. I said, no, we're supposed to have a baby. It's going to be a girl. She got pregnant seven months into it. She had to go to a specialist doctor. The, uh, how do you say that fluid? The water in her was leaking, right? And don't laugh at me. I'm from the mountains of West Virginia. I'm a hillbilly. You know, you get pregnant up there and think you got pregnant kissing. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's kind of true. <laughs> yeah. So the water broke, uh, was breaking, leaking. So they put her on bed rest. And I said, baby, they even said the daughter may be, uh, have mental problems. And they were giving her all kinds of a negative report. I said, let me tell you something. The girl I saw 12 years ago was healthy, strong, and beautiful. And when she got pregnant, I told her, it's a girl. And I know what its name is, is Amanda. So today, that girl is 22 years of age, and she's named Amanda. That's my daughter. That's our daughter. Okay? But I struggled with the other one, the miscarriage. And there's one day I said, God, I said, Pam, when I saw the baby, it didn't look healthy. And she said, the Lord spoke to her. And my wife never says the Lord speaks. If she says it, he did. That she, the Rochelle would have been born with great. She would have been born deaf. She would have been born mute. And my wife could have never traveled with me <laughs> trying to raise a baby because she's got three grandbabies she's helping now. And God knew that. I don't know. Someone said, well, why couldn't God let her be healthy? That's up to God. I don't know. This is where you say to yourself, I don't know. But something very strange happened. And this is the end of the story. I get a letter from a woman in California. I never publicly talked about Rochelle and what she looked like in the dream and all that. So this lady who does not know me, who just sees me on TV preaching on life after death, says, I've got to write you and tell you what happened. I do not know you. You do not know me. But you're preaching about life after death. My son had a disease. And when he had this disease, he became a teenager and he could never grow facial hair. 
He'd say, Mommy, look at me. I'm not even a man. I can. And she said, it would break my heart. And he passed away. He said he loved the Lord, but he passed away. And she says, I was in my kitchen grieving over him. And she says, I fell on the floor and went into a complete trance. She says, I just fell on the floor. And she says, I wasn't in my kitchen. I left my body. Now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, that happened to him. So it's not weird. But it's a spiritual thing. I went to heaven. She says, he was sitting in a rocking chair saying, Mama. And she says, I actually got to physically hug him, his spirit, his spirit's in heaven. And he had, now I don't know how this works, but he had facial hair. He said, look, I can grow it up here. I can grow it. He, she, she, she thought it was the greatest thing. She said, I am just like, mom, this is great. Mom, now you got to quit being sad over me. You're going to come up here one day. This is great. You won't believe what we get to do. You don't believe what we get to see. And she says, in the process, as she is moving away, <laughs> there was a five, looked like four or five year old black haired girl. Beautiful. And she says, she says to her, he says, or the woman says to her, hi, oh, you're so beautiful. And the girl says, yes, I'm the daughter of Perry and Pam Stone. And she says, Perry, she's got Pam's nose, your eyes, Pam's lip. She's black headed and she's a genius. I said, I know where she got that from. <laughs> That's in my idea. <laughs> It was the most, so then that's one story. And then I was in Griffin, Georgia. I've never described this baby and a medical doctor. She's a, a doctor in Huntington, West Virginia, was going to the church. She was working on her degree. She's an artist, beautiful artist, fantastic. She brings me all these pictures. She said, I want you to pick one of these out for you and Pam. And I'm going through it. Well, you, you were in there, Charlie. That man right there knows what I'm saying. And I got to the third picture and went, oh, oh. And start heaving. And she, the pastor, he said, Perry, are you okay? No. I said, it's the picture. That's the girl we lost. I know what she looked like in the dream. She's holding the animal. Where'd you get the picture? She says, I just draw things that come into my mind. I'm telling you, it looks exactly 100% like the girl I saw. And this is when the Lord spoke to me. And he said, Mothers don't realize that the moment of conception, the life from God, which is the spirit, came into that seed. And if that baby is miscarried even a short time into it, the spirit of the baby, the life force, goes back to God, to an infant paradise. I wish I had time to preach on that. Where an angel takes that spirit and raises it like you would a person on earth. And I want to tell you mamas that have lost a baby, that when you get to heaven, God is going to keep it at a smaller age so that you can enjoy all the years you missed. <laughs> you can enjoy all those years you missed watching that little baby grow up. I'm, I, God, I wish I had another 30 minutes to preach and tell you this. And some of you have lost a child that was born. Some of you lost one that was seven, eight, nine. A child is innocent before God. There are no children in hell, period. They don't go there. In heaven, their angels watch them. But I want to say this to you. I've, there are some people here that are hurt. There are people that have been hurt at church. They've been hurt by ministers. Whether the minister did it purposely or not is insignificant. It's just you got hurt. There are people that are hurt because somebody, maybe you, maybe you just looked at God and said, why did you let this happen? Everybody that's carrying something, Everybody that's carrying something in you that you want God to finally take from you and give you peace over, if it's a loss of a child, a miscarriage. Some, some of you here had abortions. You didn't know that the spirit of a child starts a conception. Nobody taught you that. You didn't know that. But whatever it is you need for God to, to touch you of, and I want to say there's, there's a couple of people here you've lost family members and you've really laid it on God and become angry at him of why he let it happen because you don't have an answer. Okay. Would you please, when I say three on the count of three, would you please, if, even you, even you that are watching, those of you in other campuses, listen, give an altar call at the campus right now. Give an altar call. Get ready to pray. You that are on the internet, 
We're going to pray for you, okay? Everybody, would you please? Oh, oh, you want to hear? You want me to share that? One more story, Pastor wants me to tell you. Please, please just stay here for just a moment. Years ago, a man by the name of Charles Greenaway wanted to be an Assembly of God missionary. He was in the Assemblies of God. He pastored a small church in Elba, Alabama. Little, tiny church, lived in the back of the church, poor, didn't have enough money, coming in hardly to pay the bills or the food. But he had a son by the name of Daniel, and Daniel was diagnosed with leukemia. When he went to the Assemblies of God board to ask them, would you let me go to a foreign country? They turned him down because of Daniel. They said, there's no medical help there. It'll be a great burden for you trying to get help for your son and treatment for your son. We cannot let you go. Missions was on his heart, but it wasn't going to happen. Daniel got progressively worse with leukemia, and he got in such pain. One story that he told, he said, I was in my car, and I had a flat tire. I couldn't even have money for tires, and I was praying somebody would stop by. And Daniel is... Sister Greenaway is holding Daniel in the back, and he's just crying and tears coming down. He's, in, he's suffering. And a preacher waved him, hello, and went right by. Nobody stopped to help him. It was terrible. So finally, Sister Greenaway, after trying to help Daniel, getting Daniel help, nothing was working. He's getting worse. She said to Charles one night, she said, Charles, it's her husband. I've got, you got, you got to pray that God will take him. I cannot watch this boy suffer. I'm watching him suffer consistently. It is not fair for this boy, to, for us to want him to stay here. You tell God if he's not going to heal him, to take him. And Greenaway got down in a room and said, Lord, you heard my wife and I'm in agreement with her. If you're not going to heal him, take him. Now, Charles Greenaway had miracles praying for people. So he couldn't understand why God didn't heal that little boy. And that boy died that night in his mother's arms. Brother Greenaway was distraught, of course, because he knew God could heal him, but God didn't heal him. So he goes back in the room and he said something that has been said for years. It's been preached on. My daddy heard me preach it. And he said, that's the greatest one statement a preacher could ever make. Charles Greenaway got down on his knees and said, God, you could heal people, but you didn't heal my son. I know Daniel could have lived and been a great man of God, but he, he'll never have that chance. But I want you to know something. I refuse to go to hell over a mystery. I am not going to die lost over something I don't understand. I'll never understand. And you know what happened? Now watch what God does. He takes the worst thing and turns it to good. The assemblies of God called him back and said, you're now approved to be a missionary. He preached in every continent in the world except Greenland. He started thousands of churches, major Bible schools, because God allowed his son to go to heaven. The door would have never opened as long as they were treating Daniel. But here's the good news. He gets to see Daniel, and he got a reward for his work in life because he would not say, I don't understand it, and I'm mad at you because you're not telling me why. You're not giving me a reason why. Because just like God told Roberts, uh, there's things about your daughter's plane crash you'll never know on earth. But when you get to heaven, I'll tell you everything you want to know. And that comforted him. Those of you that need a healing of some type, not physical, emotional, spiritual, you've heard what I've said and if you've, if you've had a grudge against the Lord because of something, let's get, off, let's get it off of you today. You're not, you can't be lost over something you don't understand, right? So on the count of three, I, now I do count of three. There's nothing special. That, that's, that means everybody moves at once. If you need the, the word and you want to pray and you want us to agree with you over an emotional healing, maybe you've had a miscarriage, maybe you had an abortion years ago, maybe you lost a child. I just, I feel this thing about a, a, a loss of a loved one, maybe, but a younger loved one. And even if that's not your case and you want prayer, come down here. Ready? Get ready. One, two, three. Now move in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, bless your name, bless your name.
Keep coming. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the word of the Lord. God, I'm asking you to do what nobody else can do. I'm asking you to reach into their spirit real deep. And any root that has grown as a result of what has happened to them, I want you to uproot that root. It can be a root of bitterness. But whatever, whatever it is that caused the root, I'm asking you, God, to release them from the root. And God, bring healing to their spirit. Does anybody else feel this besides me? I mean, does anybody in the congregation sense what the Lord's doing? In fact, would you stand up all over the building? If you can, if you can, and put your hands up this way. I just want to say, if you have to leave, be here tonight, but stay, stay with us for a few moments if you can. I want to pray over you so bad, but the Lord is saying the needs are so various. Tell them to pray. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just start talking to the Lord, and I want every one of you to pray. You know how to pray, to ask God to remove out of your spirit what you don't understand. That thing that's driving you mentally crazy, and you just, why did you let that happen, God? Why did you let Daddy die? Why did you let my brother get killed in a motorcycle accident? Why did you let those two babies get killed in the car? You, there's, we, if, we can't, if we can't do nothing about it, what do we have to do? you got to turn it over to God at some point. Everybody lift your hands in the altars and just begin to touch the Lord. Everybody raise your hands in the, in the facility. Dear Jesus, right now, oh God, I come to you in Jesus' name. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Your spirit is all over this place. It's in us, it's around us, it's upon us. God, your word has been preached and declared, and I'm asking you right now in Jesus' name to heal the mind of the person. God, Isaiah 53 says that you bore our grief and you carried our sorrows. <laughs> I'm asking you, Lord, to help people to somehow in their mind to see them rolling this over to you and for you bearing it, Lord, because you said you did. God, help all the people that are here. Don't let any of them, Lord, be separated from you because of anger or bitterness or because of something they do not understand. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Would everybody put your hands and just pray out loud. Just as many of you that are spirit-filled right where you're at, just pray in the spirit for a little bit right where you're at to God. Come on. Oh, Lord, heal the hearts. Come on, pray it out. Everybody in the altar, God wants to hear your words. So go ahead and just open your mouth and say your words right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. God, touch every person right now at this altar service. Every man, every woman, every boy, every young person, whatever it might be, Lord, it's down in their heart that their heart has been, uh, almost, their heart has almost been a prisoner to their situation. God, they've, their heart has been a prisoner to their situation and their heart needs to be unlocked back into you, back towards you, back toward what you are able to do. Lord, I, I bind the spirit of death in Jesus' name. I bind the spirit of continual grieving, Lord. Please bring peace, bring peace, peace that passes all understanding. Satan has tried to chastise their peace and hinder their peace, but I ask you in Jesus' name, Lord, to let the Holy Spirit bring complete peace back into their mind and back into their spirit. And Lord, when, we, when, we, when we're always asking why, we don't get an answer sometimes because we won't know till we get to heaven, Lord. So help them to be at peace with that. Help them to be at peace with your answer that says, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you so I'll tell you down the road. Oh God, please help our people. God help those that have lost kids and lost children. Help the women, God, that know they've got a baby in heaven and one day they're going to see the spirit of that little one again. Help them and give them peace. Lord, I pray all over this building. There's others that didn't come down to the altar, Lord, and they need to be down here. But I'm asking you, Lord, that right where they are to let the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the living God minister to them and touch them in Jesus' name. God, take away grief. Take away sorrow. Start bringing peace. Let these men and women sleep 
better at night. Let them, when they get up, not have that thing pounding in their head and pounding in their spirit about why God, why God, why God. Lord, I've had questions. I've said, why God? And then years later, I would find out the reason. I would find out the why. We may not always know the why down here, Lord, but I pray in Jesus' name, speak peace. Everybody raise your hands and ask God to speak peace to him. Come on. If enough, if, if enough, of, if enough of us agree and we ask for peace to come on the people in this place, God will do it because there's a unity of faith here. We speak peace, Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we speak peace, God. Oh, Lord, let the Holy Spirit break the yoke, I pray. 